Spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX. Uh, we've been away for a while. I'm sure you can see that the, the fro has grown, um, but I'm very, very delighted today to be joined by Ribone Tao, who is the author of this new book, uh, The Rise and Fall of the ANC Youth League. And Ribone is uh, not only a brilliant new author, but also a political activist. And it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to her about this important subject and this important book, which when you're watching will just have been released. So Ribone, thanks so much for coming to have a chat with us on this channel. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, and hi to the viewers. <laughs> thanks. How are you feeling um, to, to be publishing a book uh, still as a relatively young South African? Um, I for one know that it's a, uh, it's an interesting thing to to be releasing a book and, and a culmination of many long hard hours. So before how before we jump into it, just how are you feeling about um, putting this out? I think uh, one must start by saying um, actually I'm the first member of the ANC or ANC Youth League because mm. when I started writing the book, uh, I was still within the ANC Youth League structures. I just graduated in April this year. But um, for me, that is a huge achievement uh, that as a member of the Youth League or ANC, I was able to um, write such a book, you know, and, 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 and having led the Youth League even at the National Trust Team level, but before that, having led the Youth League in the Tswane region, you know. So for me, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by having the support you know from fellow comrades who have actually read the book you know and and, and acknowledging that this is a well researched book um, it's not a book about gossip and internal fighting within the party that everyone is aware of in the public domain you know yeah absolutely no and, and i'm wishing you all the best for it um, i think it's really important that we write um, our view and i think what i'm excited about in the book is that I think we, we are all familiar with the distant history of the Youth League, you know, the, the uh, Lembete moment, uh, the, the challenge to Puma's ANC. But what I like about your book is, yes, you do deal with that. And of course, in the opening chapters, you, you deal with the formation. But the heart of the book is really about the more recent history of the, of the Youth League and what has been happening, um, I would say, uh, in the story of two Nazareks and two Mangaungs. Um, and so why was it important for you to address the recent history of the Youth League um, in quite so much detail, as opposed to just uh, looking at the distant history of the Youth League, which I think is, is quite well known? I think first and foremost, I want to say... Um, the title is on its own, The Rise and Fall of the Youth League. Mm. Uh, and the fall is based on the recent events, you know, that we've seen within the organization internally. Uh, mm. The conference, I mean, the 2008 conference of the Youth League, which was in Mangawu, and a few months later had to be reconvened in Nazareth, you know, uh, that conference. And I think internally in the party, we are not able to really engage frankly of what went wrong and when did it go wrong. But through this book, we are able to say the 2008 conference where we saw new culture or new doings by members of the Youth League. I mean, it was in the papers about the behavior even of delegates when the top five was announced. And, and, and when we talk about the disbandment, we just talk about 20. 13 disbandment and the expansion of, of Julius, but we don't look at the root cause of where some of these things come from and how that conference was handled um, by, I think, also the ANC leadership at the time. And this, what is interesting that it was immediately after Poloko and a conference of the ANC, which some would say so it was a watershed conference of the ANC, then immediately the youth had to go to its Congress in 2008 after the the ANC conference in 2007. Absolutely, and, and I wanna take a look at, at just something you say about 
um, where you think the youth league is at the moment. In page 127, where you say, the youth league could once stand tall among other political formations, hold its own in the battle of ideas and win. It is now mainly associated with corruption scandals and disorganization. Its potent identity and status as an organization that counted giants like Mandela, Sisulu, Tambo among its luminaries is now a memory. The ANC has abandoned, the ANC Youth League has abandoned its political mandate. It must work to win it back. And I wondered on that, um, whether you think there's still a point of the Youth League. Um, you, you trace its fall in such detail that it leads the reader to wonder whether there's even a, even a reason to, to want this organization back or whether alternatives, um, even a youth party, for example, are, are better alternatives than a youth league, which is so, so fundamentally in some ways it seems compromised. What do you, what do you think of that? Firstly, one must say that we live in a very youthful population in South Africa as a country. And the only youth formation of youth political party uh, or that we all know of is the Economic Freedom Front, you know, uh, economic EFF. Right. Sure. And, and the EFF was formed by members of the Youth League. Um, we all know that Julius Malema was expelled from the Youth League and Floyd Shivambo was expelled and um, they then decided to form the EFF, which then had, uh, because they had a huge following within the ANC Youth League, mm. you know, and that's why it was easy for other Youth League members to, to just live with them, you know, and, 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 and form part of this new political party. But if you look at other political parties cut across, whether the UDM, whether the DA, whether the IFP, Mm -hmm. um, most of them are still led by people who are not who are no longer youth, you know. That's uh, for sure. And 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 the reality of the matter is that we need to understand when the youth league was formed, its primary task was to champion interest of young people and rally them behind the banner of the NC. And as I said earlier on, that we've got a very youthful pop population, so the youth league still remains relevant. Unfortunately, in the current uh, political landscape in South Africa, there is vacuum. And that's why if you do research on the, whether even the previous elections or the 2016 elections, you can see how the EFF has been able to capture um, um, young people's imagination in this country because the EFF vote in the main is from um, the youth of this country. Uh, more than anything, and that's why you, at some point we saw the EFF winning, um, the, the EFF student command winning across different uh, institutions of higher learning. You know, mm. but I still believe that the youth league, if it's given its space to organically rebuild itself, you know, outside of the factions within the NC, it, it can still play that meaningful role of championing interest of young people. Uh, mm. Because you can't even a youth league that is so inward looking today. Because theirs is more focused on whether being a councillor or being a member of parliament. Uh, in in 2015, I'll give you an example. Mm. The youth league takes a, a, a resolution which is correct in my view. About 40 percent of young people should be given the opportunity. But in the, I don't think that they did an analysis or research to look at even uh, companies in the private sector across to say, in this company, we have so many young people with the experience and uh, the qualifications who deserve to be at this managerial post position. So the, the, since 2015, they, they, they've been so inward looking that it's more about becoming a counselor, becoming an MP, but mm -hmm. not looking at the private sector because they're not speaking to the youth outside of the organization. They're mainly focusing on the youth youth within the organization, which for me, I think that is a dishonest approach for any political uh, youth formation. Mm. Well, well, let's, let's go back a, a little bit, um, which you do so interestingly in the book, and, and look at the genesis of, of this problem here, um, this fall. 
Because I think what's, what's really interesting about this work is you spend a lot of time looking at from, let's say, Pulukwane, how the Youth League evolved and then eventually devolved. So take us back to the Polokwane moment when also the Youth League's term is about to come to an end in, in 2018 and um, Malema's Youth League is really born and how some of the seeds of both the Youth League's strength and its destruction are sown in that moment of intense factionalism within the ANC. I think when we look at the problems, we must not only look at the 28 conference of the Youth League. We can go back to as 2005. You had um, the former deputy president of the Youth League, Ruben Moshalwa, who was suspended building up to the Polokwane conference because he was seen to have a descending view, which was supporting um, the then president um, of the ANC, Thabo Mbeki. And while the other clique within the Youth League, you know, um, were supporting um, the Zuma moment, you know, going to the Polokwane conference. Now, mm. alone that, that suspension started a new culture, you know, in the movement, uh, in the Youth League, where you hold, when you hold a descending view, then you, you get suspended, you know. Uh, well, I mean, interesting enough, you know, um, after the expulsion of Malema in the Youth League, uh, you had Pulema, who was expelled in the Youth League himself, you know. <laughs> and uh, after his election in the ANC MEC in 2012, in 2013, uh, before the disbandment, his expulsion was then reversed, you know. Mm. And then he came back as the treasurer ter- general of the Youth League again, you know. But it shows the, 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 those that from 2005, that's where the Youth League started to have problems, you know, uh, where you mm. could see the Youth League being very. Uh, you know, there's a thin line, I always say, between radicalism and anarchy. So mm. the, 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 the the anarchy, would then we started seeing it, you know, uh, because of, as I said, the, the 2007 conference of the ANC was, as we always say, it was a watershed conference. So it did not only start on the eve of 2007, but from sure. 2005, when President Zuma himself was suspended, if you, if you recall, Mm. Um, when he was removed as the deputy president of the republic, you know, and then they started, we started seeing the mobilization, uh, the youth league going to Marisbe court to support his case and, and so forth, you know. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That's an interesting um, starting point, actually, because as you say in, in, the, in the earlier chapters, I suppose, before you get to um, disbandment and even factionalism, you do start to chart even that earlier history. And it's interesting to think actually, because in many ways, the factionalism within the ANC as a whole, which really began um, in a new era around 2005 with the, with the Zuma Mbeki tussle, had uh, consequences on every organ of the ANC, including the Youth League. And much of what we see can be traced back even to that fight. Um, which I think is a really interesting insight as we look at the the organization as it stands today. Yeah, but again, I want to take you back to say that factionalism is not a new thing in the ANC. And I like when you started in the beginning, when you spoke about the emerging of Kuma, you know, because mm. uh, at the time, the ANC had a program of action, where, which uh, then said, um, Tuma, are you going to support this program of action as the president of the ANC for us to give, give you another term? And he was not really buying into that uh, program of action of the ANC clique. And that's why the likes of Mandela, Sisulu and them and, and Tambo then started engaging Morocco, you know, to say to Morocco. Um, and before that, I mean, they engaged uh, other uh, 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 leaders of the ANC to say, are you available for this position? of the president of the ANC, you know, and other leaders said, no, um, we, we're not available. And Kuma said, uh, Moroga said, no, he's available for this position. So in, in the past, factionalism was not more about, in my view, not about resources, but it was an ideological, you know, uh, factionalism, because the ANC in its nature, it is a broad church, you know, uh, we've got different school of thoughts within the ANC. 
but in, 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 since its formation, the ideological battles have always been there. And that's why the youth league then supported Morocco, Morocco, who eventually became the president of the ANC based on the program of action that the youth league of the generation of 1944 tabled to, to, at the conference of 1949. But over the years, you know, uh, you have seen that the factionalism is not more ideological, it's more about defending and um, about positioning yourself strategically, whether for deployment, you know, uh, uh, whether for business and so forth. So let's let's come to to the moment after Polokwane, because we've we've looked at some of the you know the genesis of that moment, especially the the battles which as you say are, are endemic in all political parties but but something did seem to happen leading up to Polokwane which was very divisive and then you had essentially the the Malema era in in the youth league and you have an interesting take on what that meant for for the organization both in the way it some ways uh, sowed the seeds of the decline as you put it but also uh, strengthen the organization in the lead up to elections. Take us through what you think um, the legacy of Julius Malema's Youth League is between 2008 and 2012-11. I think, um, yes, Malema, Malema comes in, uh, in 2008 um, after the conference had to reset again in Nazarek. And what is it with Nazrek and Mangaung hey, and the ANC? Just don't have conferences <laughs> in Mangaung and Nazrek. <laughs> <laughs> but what was interesting now about this is that Malema, in his nature, I mean, he is someone who he's got that thing as a leader. You know, when he speaks, he's able to capture people's attention. You know, and during his era as the president of the Youth League, and I think he, coming from a conference which was highly contested of the outcomes, you know, he needed to affirm himself uh, to also even the society, because whether or not the media was covering this conference, uh, South Africans were following what was happening at this youth league conference. Mm. So he had himself also to affirm himself as a leader of the, one of the progressive uh, youth formations, because you've got the pro progressive South, PYA, the progressive youth um, of South Africa, which it's COSA, SARS-CoV, and the YCL. And one of the things that even under his leadership, uh, what is acknowledged was the lack of political education. But they had programs, you know, visible programs that spoke mm. to the youth of this country. And that's why he was able to, even when he formed the EFF, he was able to get the attention because of what he had built over years as the president of the ANC Youth League, you know. Um, that, I mean, he would, I mean, I remember one interview with him and uh, the Deborah Pata, you know, one of, someone who was very respected as a journalist, you know, mm -hmm. he was able to engage uh, on, on, on even difficult issues, you know, and, 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 and he always brings content, you know, whatever that he would engage on as the president of the youth league. So uh, the, the programs that they uh, had, uh, from 2008 up to 2011, and I'll say why up to 2011, the mm -hmm. program that was speaking to the youth, and there was a build up to the 2011 conference. Mm -hmm. Because the 2011 conference, the resolutions alone of that conference, uh, it's what the EFF talks about today, but those are resolutions of the youth league. But interesting enough is that you can go to the 19. 49 program of action of the ANC and look at the 2011 resolutions. Uh, they are not far from each other. Um, they, um, they were merely reminding the ANC leadership what, uh, let's close the door, what um, the ANC had committed to at the time, you know, um, in 1949. So you, you have that, uh, that shows that, and, and, and those resolutions, they are done serious research, you know, studies comparing also to other countries, you know, so that when they engage the NC, uh, they engage the NC from an informed point of view. And then let's come to this, the disbandment then, um, because we have a youth league that is 
in the first Zuma term occupying a lot of media attention. Um, Malema himself is really on the center stage of South African politics at this moment. But slowly there seems to be um, opposition to Zuma growing towards Mangaung, again, the 2012 ANC um, conference in Mangaung. And in the background to this contestation against Zuma, there's also this um, disciplinary process that's happening, um, eventually leading to um, the suspension and expulsion of various leaders. And this paves the way for a later um, disbandment. Take us through that, that Mangawung moment and, and the 2011, 2012 period and why you think this is an important moment um, for the organization and, and its traje trajectory from that moment. I mean, already when we went to the 2012 conference, um, Julius at the time was expelled. And if you recall, he had even written a letter to the conference, you know, to try and appeal uh, the decision of his expulsion because he felt that he, he is fine if they have suspended him and removed him as the president of the ANC Youth League, but mm. can they not please take away his membership, you know? But unfortunately, that letter was not engaged uh, in plenary, um, mm. and, 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 and 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 there was discussion, you know, in plenary on, on the issue of the ANC Youth League uh, to say this is where the Youth League is. Uh, unfortunately, my, the soul of uh, Comrade Sindhu Makaka rest in peace. Uh, Makaka, mm -hmm. who was then the Secretary General of the ANC Youth League, who was now suspended for a year, and this suspension, I think, it was going to be lifted in April. So they disbanded the youth league in March, just before even the suspension of Makaka is, mm. uh, is, is, is lifted. But the conference comes to a resolution and it says the incoming ANC and uh, should engage on the matter of the youth league. The conference will not take any decision on the ANC youth league. Um, the conference, the NEC will then have to reflect and see if whether, because there were other op options for the youth league. It's either to go to NGC, which then will replace uh, Malema, who's expelled as the president. Uh, Makata, yes, he would have came back as the secretary general. Or you would go to an early conference of the ANC youth league, right? And then, then there was the option, which I think the ANC felt, it's, which I, personally I feel that, uh, uh, decision was an emotional decision. Uh, the ANC eventually felt that uh, we're going to disband the ANC Youth League, you know. Uh, I feel that uh, they should have probably gone for two options. Because at the time, I was leading in Swan in the RSC of the ANC Youth League in the region. And I remember we had deployees who came from national and the province to say to us, and these are the options that are tabled by the NEC of the NEC click that we go for NGC or we go for an early conference. So that mm -hmm. means branches of the youth league would then have to reflect and then say as a region, we feel that let's go for an NGC or let's go for an early congress. But unfortunately, before that, before the youth league could finalize you know, that process internally, uh, the mm -hmm. NC then took a decision to disband uh, the NC youth league, which then led to the Test team that I was part of in 2013. So I want to just pause there in the, in the historical narrative and, and ask you a question that I think runs as a theme through the book, even though there isn't a chapter on it. And this is the question of gender in, in the ANC Youth League. Um, it's an organization that has not had uh, a woman president. Often uh, leadership has been dominated by men. And on the contrary, in your book, which I think is refreshing, takes the voices of various women leaders within um, the Youth League where you interview various people and charts the story of different women leaders at different points of the movement within the story. Why did you think that was an important angle to, to thread throughout the chapters? Um, and I think it's an interesting angle that, that hasn't been looked at um, in sufficient detail. I mean, um, in the book, I make an example of COSAS. Uh, COSAS, mm. since its formation as a two female presidents, um, the other one, the first one being uh, the late Sandra Baloi, and the second one being Zama, uh, the president, uh, who became president of COSAS. 
the youth league since its formation has only had two female secretary generals and the first one being a uh, Porchitar, mm-hmm. who became a secretary general uh, and uh, Malusi Gaba. And then you have got Vuisa Tulela, who became the secretary general, uh, and uh, Chulas Malema, you know. And interesting enough, both of them are ambassadors, you know. Uh, Vuisa Tulela is, a, is currently serving as an ambassador to New Zealand. Uh, Phoebe Porchider, uh, she served as an ambassador to Poland. Um, she's currently the general manager of the ANC at Lutuli House. But it, this also shows you the quality or, you know, uh, of female comrades that the ANC Utlik has been able to produce that today when they are given this responsibilities within the movement or within the state. But interesting enough, you'll always find a situation where out of the top five, there will be one woman and four men, you know, mm. and, and 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 that's why you know when we're going to the 2017 conference, uh, you know that the youth league was supporting Mamunko Sazana Zuma for for president, mm. and some of us will question, but in the youth league, how many even chairpersons of regions or provinces do you have as women? If today you are able to stand up and say. Uh, Mamunko Sazana Zuma must become the president. Why don't you also look at yourself internally as an organization on the issue of patriarchy, you know? And, and not that there are not women who are not capable of leading as presidents in the youth league. There's a lot of uh, young yeah. women which I think do have the capacity and, ca- and can take the ANC youth league to, to greater heights. You know, they've, mm. they've sought the ranks of the organization. But unfortunately, um, men have always been the ones to sit at the dinner table and take decisions, you know. And, and, mm-hmm. and, and you see, you have a constitution which says 50-50. And sometimes you, you might want them think that the 50-50, uh, it's only done because of it's compulsory per the constitution. So they will just put them as additional members. Okay, let's try and put uh, 50% within the additional members of women because the constitution says so. But I think if the constitution was not saying that, uh, I don't think that um, we'd have a uh, balanced, you know, NEC, whether both in the ANC or in the ANC league that have got a representation of women. I mean, look at uh, in the previous uh, ANC, NEC officials, we had two female of- officials, you had Bale Gambete and Jesse Duarte. But in this NEC, uh, you only have one female. It shows mm-hmm. that the struggle of women within the organization still has a long way to go. People, when they vote, they're not conscious that uh, there are women who have got capacity, who should be also given an opportunity to lead. Because it's not a, it must not be as if they're doing women a favor, you know? Uh, women had, do have the capacity to lead uh, in all spheres of life, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting reading through the book where you mentioned different people from Phoebe Potrita to um, Stella Ndabeni Abrams, for example, current minister. You realize, wow, various uh, prominent uh, state ANC leaders have actually made it through the Youth League, even though often within the youth league, they don't rise to prominent positions of leadership. Um, and so it would be interesting, I think, as the organization tries to rebuild itself, which remains to be seen, you know, whether it will actually tackle this, this question and reform itself in a way that's far more representative um, of questions of gender. And, and on that note, I want, to, I want to just come to finally the, the present. You know, um, to be honest, although you detail it um, very clearly and it was nice to reread the very recent history to understand where we are. I think people have largely just tuned out who who aren't part of of the organization and understand it on a day-to-day basis. And it's just hard for people to know what's even happening with the youth league. You know, there's something about an election, then the election's postponed, and then is there even a youth league anymore? Uh, Take us through where you think things are now and why at the end of the book, you kind of put together a set of letters from former youth league leaders um, for the next generation to say something needs to change. 
the NC NC League NEC, which was led by uh, Colin Maine, was disbanded mm. um, last year. Uh, you had young people from different provinces, you know, uh, mobilizing. And 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 and, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the things which came out of that process was that you had now the Secretary General of the ANC Youth League, uh, Zunza, who is mm. the Deputy Minister of Home Affairs, uh, being now a member of Parliament and now being uh, in the executive uh, through being the Deputy Minister, which historically, it has never happened where a Secretary General, because being as an SG, you are full-time per the constitution. Mm. So those are some of the things that uh, young people were raising that it means we don't have an organization anymore if you don't have the uh, the, 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 the SG uh, right. full-time at the Tula House per the uh, constitution. You had the president, uh, Colonel Maine, who also went to parliament, but he later resigned as an MP, mm. uh, which also, by the way, in the youth league, the president per the constitution is full-time. So now you, had an, you have now an organization which is left with only the TG, you know, uh, in the office, the deputy president, the president, mm. the SG, the DSG, the all in government. Mm. And the question is that uh, the youth league needs to go to conference uh, and will these comrades have uh, time to take the, because when you go to uh, Congress of the youth league, it's not as simple as people think, you know, especially a national Congress. It can take you a year to prepare just for that process. Sure. Now, when you have government uh, responsibility, because the, D, the DSG to Nzunza, uh, Tandemuraka, is a MEC of uh, sports in Limpopo. So alone in the D, D, DSGO, you don't have anyone who's going to be full-time in the organization. So mm. these young people then were lobbying. And then there's the issue of the liquidation of the youth league. I'm not sure where it is currently at this present moment. Mm. But mm. there was a letter that uh, was written by the Secretary General of the ANC, Isma Khashule, to, uh, to members to say the youth league has been liquidated and they're trying to get it to be rehabilitated. So I'm not sure where, what is happening with that process. Mm. Then a task team was formed after the ANC of the youth league was disbanded. But the task team that was formed, it was of ANC, NEC members. So they call it the ANC National Youth Task Team. Mm. Most of the comrades in that task team are ministers. They are NEC members of the ANC. So they've got mm. political work to do in terms of the ANC work. Then they've got government to do in terms of their responsibilities in government. Mm. The question is, will they have the time to rebuild the youth league? Uh, I don't think so. We've seen up to so far that there's not been any movement. Uh, mm. Let's leave COVID uh, because the initial that said the conference will sit in April this year, but there was no sense that this Congress will sit in April this year. Uh, mm. We knew that it would be postponed again. So at this present moment where the youth league is sitting, there's a task team and there are young people who have been observing on social media and some have been doing uh, media interviews with different media houses to say, uh, the task team must be dissolved and young people must take over the task team of the youth league. And mm. I am saying, uh, you know, you have had, since 2013, you have had four task teams of the youth league and, and, and nothing has mm. come out of that task team. So that means the top bottom approach is not working. So in my view is that disband the youth league from national which national, by the way, the NEC has been disbanded. So you just have to remove the task team of NC leaders, disband the provinces, disband the regions, and disband the branches. And allow the NC League to grow organically, uh, make sure that members of the Youth League become community activists, because that is what is also missing in the NC Youth League. Uh, they, most of its members uh, are, are not really active in their communities to deal with the challenges that face the communities. Because whether or not, there are different challenges on a day-to-day -day facing the communities. And work on the issue of political education, because the danger of having members who don't understand 
politics uh, or even the organization that they are a member of. They, that's why then you will have, which is a known phenomenon in the ANC, uh, members of members. So you mm-hmm. also have that automatically in the youth league, members of members, because of they did not go through a serious political education to understand and appreciate this organization and to understand that it was led by leaders who had a vision, you know, I mean, they, the leaders of 1944, their vision or mission was to achieve political freedom, of which they did. But our generation is to work towards uh, economic freedom, you know, in our lifetime, you know. Uh, and, 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 and that is where it's, it's missing, where you, you have members who not even understand resolutions of, the, of, of conference to even engage and articulate them at any platform uh, you know, with the, so, with, with the society, because for you to go and engage people outside of the ANC, you really need to understand even documents of the ANC so that you're able to stand firm to say these are the resolutions, this, or this is the manifesto, this is what the ANC stands for. And, and, and you can't have a situation where you only have the youth league on the ground during elections, doing door to door, but between elections, uh, like even now, I mean, with COVID uh, 19. I'm not sure where are members of the youth league within the various communities because the challenges are there. We need a youth league right now that can say uh, we are we are in COVID. What are the economic recovery plans? You know, post COVID nineteen, a lot of people we know have lost jobs. More are still to have jobs. The president had promised us before COVID that uh, there would be so much jobs for young people, and due to COVID, those jobs did not come through. So what will happen to the youth between now and maybe the next elections, which is in 2020, 2024. So we need a youth league that will bring such discussions to the ANC because the youth league in its nature, it gives new ideas to the ANC. The youth league in its nature, it, 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 it gives life to the ANC. And that's why the ANC, I mean, today, the ANC ANC meeting has started which will end on Sunday. And I've been saying to a lot of people, this ANC, ANC meeting that's sitting today, it's a make or break for the ANC. If the ANC will not deal very harshly with issues of corruption, it's the people of South Africa are tired. Mm. People have lost jobs. People are not in a good space. They don't want lip service anymore. The sad part is this ANC meeting sits, the youth league is not there. Why? Because the youth league was disbanded. So the youth league is represented by ANC and its members who automatically would be sitting in the meeting. So you don't mm-hmm. even have the youth voice that will champion and say, guys, I'll, uh, you, are, you continue to fight along factional battles within this ANC and its But these are the issues that are affecting this country. These are the issues that are affecting us, the youth of this country, which, by the way, we are the future. You know? So it is, it is in the best interest of the youth league to be given space to rebuild itself uh, because that means if they don't do that, the ANC is going to die a slow death, you know, uh, because people can be patient, but don't push people's patience. We have seen in the last elections uh, how uh, the ANC dropped to 56%. We have seen in the last local uh, elections how the ANC lost Swan Metro. The NC lost uh, Ekurulen, which is in coalition with the AIC. We have seen uh, uh, Chobek. We have seen Nelson Mandela. And, 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 and those votes that they've lost is votes of young people. And the young person, you can't tell them about the history of the NC. The young person is worried about today. Uh, what does it mean for them um, in terms of building their own life, getting jobs, and, and all that? You know? So uh, that, that is a problem. I'll give you an example. Uh, NEFSAS uh, recently issues a statement and say, I think around 4,000 students, uh, they found out that uh, they don't qualify for NEFSAS, you know, uh, there's a SARS issue. But the students were saying, our parents are unemployed, you know, and, and before COVID, their parents were unemployed, but they've been told now they have to reappeal this, this process. So in 2017, you take a conference on free education, you come back in 2020, and exclude students. So it shows, and, and now there's mm-hmm. the youth voice is not there to be championing this uh, uh, struggle of students and to say to the NC, as it sees even today, to say, 
there is this problem while we're dealing with corruption there are students who are going to be sidelined and these students have to write their final exams for this year now you have given students a panic mode you know and now they're no longer focused you know because now they don't know their fate and so forth yes well you know it's funny because my my feeling is you make such a strong case for 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 the need for the youth league that i i, I just wonder you know is it, where's the cutoff you know um how much longer would young people wait until there's a youth league you know is it is it one year is it two years is it five years at, at what point do young people just say you know what like i don't care anymore either we do something new or or we just we just abandon this this ship because quite frankly um it seems as though there's, a, there's almost a systematic plan to suppress the the youth voice i know i was i said we're ending but uh what you said just 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 forced me to think that i mean um when if you would disband the youth league as i'm saying stop the top bottom approach do the bottom top approach that does not mean the young people can mobilize themselves behind the banner of the anc and do community activism work those who are students uh, whether sure. at varsity level can work very close with sasco to advance the struggle of the students well even <laughs> sorry 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 um but but even or even uh form a plan to 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 lead the organization um you know why why should it be that that someone who's the age of 30 can't can't lead the ANC um or or 35 um it just seems to me that this uh, notion this notion of a discussion hmm. which has i think if i'm not wrong there was a a paper during the task team that we crafted you know mm. but there's been a discussion that probably we should review the age limit you know of of the nc youth league and mm. and, uh, and i like what you're saying uh, when uh, or tambo became the secretary general of the nc he was in his 30s you know uh, when president ramaphosa became the secretary general of the nc he was 35 so i fully agree with you i mean you uh, go back further even the same uh, yeah, it was never know? yeah or so at least you, there was uh, often there were often young people not just leading the youth league but leading the organization itself the nc yeah so within the nc league yes, there's been in different corners you know there's been a discussion that probably the mm. cut of year must be cut to 25 years because some have argued that listen um, your priorities mm. become different when you're in your 30s you know you're starting your family sure. you know and all this. so mm. you can't be really bothered you know you're worried about bread and butter issues and that's why then you'll end up being you know find yourself being a member of a member because now it's survival of the <laughs> fittest you know and mm. got a family to take care of compared to someone who's in their 20s who's probably still staying at home mm. so their priorities are not the same you know in terms of uh, advancing the struggle uh, of, of the youth of this country so i would agree with you um that historically even in the ANC you've had young people leading the ANC and this uh, gives us an opportunity to say while there's this vacuum of the youth league you know um going to also the ANC next conference because mm -hmm. for the first time you know i've been telling people that you must look at the patterns mm -hmm. for the first time in 2017 you have officials of the ANC who are not all in exile. That must mm. tell you how the political terrain is changing within the ANC. And, and, and I foresee the next conference having a lot of young people uh, contesting uh, to be in that ANC, mm. NEC. Uh, some might contest to be in the officials. Uh, we, we are, we'll see how the momentum goes going to the conference. Uh, because one something that someone always says that you know there are people in the youth league who are there just for money because i always say in politics we join politics for different reasons and there are those who are there for money there are those who are genuine activists who care about the well-being of the people who want to make change in, in society uh, but those who are there for money you see them because now they want to have the youth league to use as a vehicle mm. to get a seat at the table for business or for jobs so they will all run to the ANC and contest the, 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 the conference and mm. because they will want to have a seat at the table. So they will see mm. now the only vehicle now being the ANC. 
uh, which again might be a problem if you have people who are just there to benefit themselves. That means that mm. the ANC will not cleanse itself and you know, self correct, you know, because of the caliber of people that might be leading there. Because the issue here is about the caliber of people that uh, should be given the responsibility to, to lead, and it should be people who care about the people of this country. Because the liberation did not st stop in 1994 when the ANC got in, in, in government. The people of this country still need to be liberated. You look at the inequalities that we see